Hello, welcome to Podfix Galore. I'm your horrible online reader, Goldscuth. I read out loud fanfictions for you, busy bees. Free of charge and no strings attached. Today, I will continue reading the Silmarillion fic from Aeolian Sands from Argive of Our Own called The Rescue Party. I hope you can at least try to enjoy my voice, and I will try my best for you with the equipment available to me. Also, pardon for any sounds that I'm unable to edit out. I'm on a holiday. On with the show. The Rescue Party, Chapter 36, Destiny. Kilgala decided that he never should have left the forest. Somehow, the fateful decision to leave the shadows beneath the trees resulted in a flying ship barreling straight at him. Did I not just escape from one of these? Was my time as a sailor so unacceptable that my parents as God have sent me another floating monstrosity? Get down! Derpe, or at least Kilgala thought that was his name, shouted. Together the two hit the ground, just as the massive hull came to a stop above them. Cousins! Someone gleefully shouted. Then an elf with dark hair and blue robes was sliding down a rope. Moria, it's been far too long. The newcomer slapped his father on the shoulder. Karanthir shrugged him off. Kurva and little Tilpe! You're not so little anymore. Kilaprimbur smiled. Taller than Atar. Well, everyone is taller than your Atar, with the sole exception of your Atar's Atar. Madras cleared his throat. Aragano, it's good to have you back, the Lord of Himring said. I would say I am bewildered by your method of transportation, but then there are many bewildering revelations as of late. Aragano bowed. Yay. For one, the land has never looked quite so fiery. Last time I lived, it was all ice, and now it is in flames. Careful, Nalafinweon. We don't need you challenging Gano in poetry, Gelacorn warned. Never would I dare. Now, here are the two I have not met, a beautiful lady and a young lad. Which one of you tricked the poor woman into a life of pandemonium and a certain misery? Whose son has such a noble face? For long moments, no one answered. Gilgalad felt the silence get awkward, so he spoke up. God on theory is my author, he said. But the lady Andreth loves, um, Lord Aikanara? Aragon's eyebrows shut up. So much drama, and I have missed it all. Lamion, do you hear? A grandson of Fëanor and a lover for a clueless Aikanara. Lamion? Madras asked. Yes, Iris' son. Kilgrim had to sit down on hearing that revelation. Wait, cousin Iris has a son? Yes, you dead slamshank, Gorva snapped. Were you not listening in the meeting when mother said that father was leaving Ondolinda with Iris' son? Kilgallad wondered just who Iris was and how many family members he would have to meet. He was a little concerned that all of them would be named Finwe. How did Iris' son get to Valinor? Galantir asked. Unless... His already pale face became ashen. Unless... Was he in Mondos? His father... No, he was in the fields. Something about a bat, but he can explain it better than I. Counselor Lamion! It is not like an advisor to a king to hide from company! A dark head ap appeared over the guardrail. I am not hiding, thank you, Lord Aragano. Perhaps I do not fancy rope burn or wear it as a fashion statement like some. Ah, Aragon proclaimed. There is the counselor imagine from the tapestries. You were a bit too wide-eyed and dazed earlier, but I see you have found your bite. Good. Now, your loyal advisorness. You can use the sleeve of your tunic, or I think there is a rope ladder. Of course, if you were to jump, I could catch you like a fair maiden. Aragon's teasing received no answer, but in a few moments a rope ladder appeared and a cautious Maeglin slowly made his way down to the ground. So, cousins, Aragon continued, I heard something about our heads that can pierce Dragonhide. A wicked gleam appeared in Kelebrimbor's eye. He unshouldered the sack to reveal the sharpened metal. Ah, but do we have a bowmaster? Gelakon raised his hand. Look no further. I can take down the beast with my eyes closed. Then a distant roar echoed through the sky. Gilgala doubted this one strange uncle with gold-silver hair could really take on such creature alone. Aragona seemed to agree. All right, not looking too promising. What about Spearmasters? A shot of adrenaline went through Gilgalad's veins. Should he say anything? Then he saw Majos raised his stump of an arm, and, and Gilgalad shyly put his own arm up. A start! Well, Artanis was sounding very panicked when he magicked her way into my mind. 
Let's be away. I suppose Turko's entourage of four-legged creatures can come as well. All aboard! Winian jumped on Turko excitedly, and Michaelin looked at his uncle with dull eyes. I just... Kilgard looked at him with sympathy. Well, he understood the feeling. Clip clop, counselor, we don't want to miss the boat. After everyone had climbed the ladder and Annette had been lowered to help Juan and Winian up to the deck, Argon made it for the wheel. A sharp whistle caught him off. Step away from the helm, Naldo, and no one gets hurt, Andreth demanded. Gigot determined that he was stuck in a time loop of the worst sort. Rock decided that the undercover plan was going surprisingly well considering the two Noldering royals involved. He was leading the group in a single line along the wall of the cave, and for several miles the streaming and marching orcs paid them no heed. Then the mindless army ceased and a rear guard of five balrogs appeared, the one in the center having four horns instead of two. This one looked straight at him with the eyes of soul-piercing fire. Lord Gothmog's horn has yet to sound, and yet here there are thralls. It said in Sindarin, its pattern of speech one of the few remaining signs of the demon's once holy station. Escapees from the mines, Rock sneered in a rough black speech, tugging on the length of tight fabric loop through everyone's bounds. Fenro stumbled, but Prince Manuel above remained quiet. Why do they still live? The beast growled, whips of fire escaping its mouth as it spoke. It reached for its whip and snapped it, twigs of fire alighting the tunnel walls. Rock flinched despite his will. Oh, look, give me courage. Look at them, Rock proclaimed in the same Sindarin. His accent was rough and crude, befitting of a lifelong slave, yet his tone was one of brazen boldness, and he carried not a hint of natural fear that flickered ever so dimly in his fear. There could be no weakness. No doubt in his speech, if they were to survive this ordeal. Noldor, fair Noldor, the entire lot, he continued. The golden one might be a vanier by blood. Will he be taking the punishment of wasting such blood on the floors of the caves? I'll present them to our lord. Why would a thrall be sent to retrieve thralls? Huh, you demons speak high and fine, but your minds are no marvel. You've been sent to Gondolin, which is a mighty mission. Perhaps you want to trade? Rog held out the linen rope. You take these four elves. I return with Durkan's bloody head. Well, Rock's eyes flared. Rock willed again for his raising heart to slow. Flagrant slave. The twisted Omaya growled and then swooped into a low crouch, grabbing Rock's arm in one hand and turning his head to the side with the other massive black claw. Rock realized then that the game was over. Yet still, he refused to cower, refused to give in to fear. In fact, the elf lord smiled as the Balrog attempted to read the brand that had once been on his neck. He smiled because he had long ago set a red-hot medallion over the entire brand and burned the whole area anew, leaving only indiscernible scar tissue. The twisted demon before him would thus discern no mark, no symbol of slavery on him, and never warn anyone ever again. What is this? Rog's grin widened and his green eyes lit with emerald fire. He twisted his head out of the Balrog's grip and stared into its demonic eyes. This is one who is free! And then there was power in his defiant voice. Then he wrenched his arm away. And that's more than I can say about you! He shouted, stomping on the Balrog's foot. He roared loud and grievous. Run! He yelled then at the others as he darted beneath the creature's shadowed legs. Whips of fire snapped, scorching deep marks in the ceilings and floors of the caves. But the close quarters worked to the elves' advantage. A bestial shout echoed off the cavern's wall as one of Balrog's whips struck an arm of another in the sudden chaos. Rock saw fire dancing in his vision, and he leapt over flickering tongues of flame. Then he was spinning to avoid a collision with the demon's black-orange thigh. Then he saw Arad held beside him. She had easily torn the loose bounds off her wrist. Great plan! She chirped. We've made it this far! He reminded her, the joyous thrill of defying the shadow tormentor bellying his spirit. Then another natural cry as two of the fire demons collided with each other and fell. Rock looked back to see Fenor leaping over one of the flailing arms with Ecthelion beside him. There was no time to look for Glorfindel. He continued to run. Get them! The Balrog speaker roared from behind. A lash of flame snapped at Rock's heels. Oh, here! Aradhel called. Rock raced to her side where she was standing on an inside bend of the tunnel, opposite side from where they had been walking. There was a large vertical fissure, just wide enough for them to fit through. Aradhel turned to her side and slid through, Rock following without question. 
Soon, he heard the grumbled complaints of Fëanor as the rock likely cut into his exposed chest. Then there was pounding like a siege engine from the walls behind them. They're trying to break down the rock and follow us! Claude Findel shouted from behind. Rock mumbled a quick prayer of thanks that his friend had made it. I see a thin light! The crack opens soon! Almost there! Adethel shouted. And sure enough, the rock walls did give away to reveal a small ledge, and thirty feet below was a pool of water that seemed to glow, giving light to the area. Well, that's not strange, noted Fëanor when there was a horrible straining noise as the Balrog slammed their might against the other side of the passage. Strange is better than dead, Rock declared. Then he leapt off the edge without giving himself a moment to consider whether or not that was truly the best idea. The water that met him was cool but bearable, and aside from the glow, was normal water. Twin splashes next to him indicated that two others had followed, and soon Arendhel and Fëanor were treading on water beside him. Then, the horrible sound of rockfall clattered from above. Rock looked up to see the walls behind the ledge disintegrate as the four-horned leader burst through with one other demon at his side. Jump, you sparkly morons! He shouted at Glorfindel and Ecthelion who were still on the ledge. Ecthelion looked ready to do so, but a whip ensnared his arm and he was yanked backward. Immediately, Rock's view was obscured by one of the two-horned fire demon moving to stand on the ledge, blocking the elves' escape. Stones and boulders rained down and splashed into the water. Move back! Arathel ordered. Rock did so, knowing full well that a caved-in skull would do him no favors, yet his keen eyes never left the ledge. They have no weapons, he realized in alarm. The cracking of whips followed, and Rock could only imagine his friends attempting to dodge in the limited space. Then it was a clarion shout, reverberating off the walls around the pool. Rog looked up just in time to see Ecthelion slam his head into the chest of the demon closest to the ledge, sending them both off the edge. With efficient strokes, Rog swam backward to avoid being crushed under the fire demon's falling body. He made it in time, but could not avoid the great tidal wave that slammed him against the opposite wall. The Balrog screeched something unholy before its heavy armor quickly dragged it into the depths, the water becoming hot with the heat of the dying flame. Ecthelion! Fëanor shouted the Elf Lord's name, surprising Rog with a sudden care in his voice. I... I am all right, the Lord of the Fountain declared as he swam over the opposite side of the pool, rubbing the back of his neck, where he would no doubt be sore next morning. They all looked up then to see Clorfindel dancing with the four-horned leader, the two of them still on the ledge. Get out of here, all of you! The Lord of the Golden Flower shouted as he dodged a whip aimed for his chest. I will hold him off! Like hell, replied Rog. Glorfindel may have smiled, it was hard to tell, because then he was turning, desperately avoiding the flames of the demon before him. Rog saw what he was doing. Slowly, Glorfindel was maneuvering his foe to be closer and closer to the edge of the cliff, an edge that was already starting to crumble. After a few more steps, a few more quick movements to avoid the snaring lash, the reverberating crack of breaking rock was heard throughout the cavern. The four-horned beast paused its relentless attacks, but it was too late. The edge gave out from under its weight. The demon screamed as it fell, its claws reached for Glorfindel's head, but they could only graze the edges of his cut hair. Swim for it! Brock yelled, and once again braced himself for sudden hot water. When the wave caught him, he tumbled, and then he was pressed fully up against the wall. But soon the water calmed as the Balrog joined its companion in the dark depths of the earth. And this is why I don't care for heavy armor, Hell said. Laura, give him join us for a relaxing swim, she called to where shocked Glorfindel was still breathing heavily on what remained of the ledge, his hands on his knees. Rock could make out some angry mark from where the whips must have struck him. Yet Glorfindel of Gondolin did not lack resilience. He gave a salute, crossing a forearm over his heart, looking somewhat ridiculous in his rags and Rock designed haircut, then he jumped to join the rest of them. Three cheers for the Balrog Slayers! Arendhel shouted once his golden head surfaced. I have no drink, but I promise you a round when all this is over. Fenrir slapped a hand on Ecthelion's shoulder. That was some headbutt. I must say, I underestimated you, Lord of the Fountain. It takes a man of certain characters to slam his skull against a Valaraukar. Oh, Don inflate his ego, Glorfindel answered, smiling. That one goes to war while playing his flute. Just the elf who took his time up there just to be sure that everyone saw him win the day, Ecthelion teased. 
Glorfindel gasped in mock offense. Did not! You did! And had you had your flowing hair, then that monster would have dragged you into the depths by it. Glorfindel responded by splashing water in his friend's face. What now? asked Vanor. I don't think climbing is an option. Well, this body of water continues this way, Otter Hell gestured. Anyone up for a swim? Rock wasn't. Not really. His heart was pounding, but he nodded all the same. I just can't wait for Vardas tapestry of this. Fanor muttered as slowly the five of them began to swim further into the cave system, looking suspiciously like crocodiles. End of chapter 36. Stay tuned. <laughs>